three. Blanche of the Most Holy Agony is the title of my translation of the screenplay Dialogue des Carmelites by the French Catholic author Georges Bernanos. The Most Holy Agony in the title refers, of course, to the fear and anguish experienced by our Lord Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before he was crucified. In the course of the next several video presentations, I'll be reading selected scenes from this work. I've taken a few liberties with the translation, like changing the title, but for the most part, I've kept as close as I can to the original French. Today, I'm going to read through the prologue and the first scene, but before I do that, I'd like to give some background. Bernanos is a writer much admired by Catholic intellectuals. The former Pope, Benedict XVI, quoted him more than once in the general audiences he gave in St. Peter's Square during his pontificate. And in his memoirs, which he wrote while he was still Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, he lists Bernanos among the great Frenchmen, those are his words, not mine, uh, that he and his fellow seminarians read at seminary in Freising. Dialogue des Carmelites was the last work Bernanos wrote. He died a few months after finishing it in 1948 at age 59. The plot is an adaptation of a novel by Gertrude von Lefort entitled Die Letzte am Schafot, The Last on the Scaffold, literally. The novel was itself loosely based on historical fact. On July 17, 1794, ten days before the end of the terror, 16 Carmelite nuns from Compiègne, who had taken a vow of martyrdom, were condemned to death by the revolutionary court. That same day, they were guillotined in Paris. Sœur Marie de l'Incarnation, Sister Mary of the Incarnation, was away from the convent on business, and so she lived to tell the tale. Based on her account, Pope Pius X beatified the martyred Carmelite sisters on May 27, 1906. There's an epigraph at the beginning of the screenplay, a quotation from Bernanos's novel La Joie. I'm going to read you the epigraph. In one sense, you see, fear is all the same, the daughter of God, redeemed on the night before Good Friday. She is not beautiful to look upon, no, sometimes jeered at and mocked, sometimes cursed, abandoned by everyone, and yet, make no mistake, she is at the bedside of every mortal agony. She makes intercession for man. One other thing I would like to share before I begin. In the diary entry for January 24th, 1948, and remember, Bernanos died that same year, this is what he wrote. We really want what he wants, and the pronoun in French is capitalized, what he wants. We really want, without knowing it, our pains, our sufferings, our solitude, whereas we only imagine that we want our pleasures. We imagine that we fear death and flee from it, when really we want this death, just as he wanted his own. Again, capitalized, he wanted his own. Moreover, our death is his, in the same manner that he sacrifices himself on every altar where the Mass is celebrated. He begins to die again in every man in his death throes. We want everything that he wants, but we don't know that we want it. We don't know ourselves. Sin makes us live on the surface of ourselves. We only come into ourselves to die, and it is there that he waits for us. Blanche of the Most Holy Agony, Prologue, Scene 1. The year is 1774. The place, Louis XV Square in Paris. It is the evening of the holiday given to celebrate the marriage of the Dauphin, the future King Louis XVI, to the Archduchess Marie Antoinette. The carriages of the aristocrats pass through the midst of the joyous crowd, held back by soldiers assigned to keep order. In one of the carriages, we see a couple, the Marquis de la Force and his much younger wife, who is pregnant. The Marquis gets out of the carriage and heads off towards the grandstands. The fireworks display begins, but suddenly the crates of rockets catch fire and a series of explosions ensues. Although there is no serious danger, panic grips the crowd. There's jostling, shoving, cries of fear, people falling to the ground and being trampled underfoot. The young Marquis, frightened, bolts the door of the carriage. The driver struggles to control the agitated horses, but they bolt and race off in a mad dash. The crowd suddenly turns ugly. 
They stop the horses. One of the carriage windows is shattered, and a man's voice cries out, Everything will soon be different. It is you others who will be massacred, and we will be the ones riding around in your carriages. The soldiers arrive in time to rescue the Marquis from being beaten to death by the angry mob. Scene 2. A few hours later, a physician comes out of the Marquis's bedroom at the Dillaforce mansion. He informs the Marquis that a daughter has just been born to him, but that the young mother is dead. Act 1, scene 1, 15 years later. The scene is the Dillaforce mansion, the date April 1789. We see the Marquis and the Chevalier, his son. The latter is obviously surprised by the presence of his father, but he is unable to restrain the burning question that is uppermost on his mind. Where is Blanche? My God, I don't know. Why the devil don't you ask her serving women instead of bursting in here without knocking like a savage? Please excuse me, Father. At your age, it's to be expected that you should be a little impulsive, just as it's natural at my age to be a creature of habit. Your uncle's visit has made me miss my midday, my midday nap, and I was just now dozing a little, truth be told. But what do you want with Blanche? Roger de Damas, who just left here, had to retrace his route twice to avoid being trapped by a huge mass of people. The word is that they're going to burn one of the king's ministers in effigy in Greve Square. Let them... When wine is cheap, one has to expect that the spring weather will overheat people's brains a little. All that will pass. If I may be so bold as to make a bad joke at your expense, I might answer that with regard to my sister's carriage, you run the risk of being a not very good prophet. The mass saw her stopped by the crowd at the crossroads at Bucy. The Marquis de la Force, who is holding his snuff box open, closes it abruptly without taking any snuff. And when his son, concerned, approaches, he waves him gently off. The carriage, the crowd. Pardon me, but those are the images that have often haunted my nights. One speaks readily today of riot or even of revolution, but whoever has not seen the multitude in panic has not seen anything. By God, all those faces with mouths twisted, those thousands upon thousands of eyes. Mercy me, from one extreme to the other, all at once, the square began to boil. One could see canes and hats flying overhead at an incredible height, as if launched into the air by the force of an immense shout. Certain eyewitnesses have sworn to me since that they did not see those hats, those canes, but I saw them. By God, I did. Sir, excuse me, I should have realized. Once more, I've spoken without thinking. The Marquis has taken up his snuff box again. He taps on the lid with his fingertips, his thoughts a thousand miles away. Bah! It's my old brain that is overheating, mine too, too quickly. But what is there in common, I ask you, between what I saw then and some who knows what minor seasonal riot drunk or drunken procession through the streets of Paris? My carriage is solid, the old horses are imperturbable, Antoine has served us for twenty years, and the two footmen are former soldiers of the Navarre Regiment. Nothing untoward will happen to your sister. Oh, it's not for her safety that I'm worried, you know, but for her diseased imagination. Blanche is only too impressionable, it's true. A good marriage will fix all that. Come now, a pretty girl surely has the right to be a little timid. Patience, you will have lions for nephews. Believe me, the thing that puts Blanche's health in peril, and perhaps even her life, is not only fear. Or rather, it is fear forced back into the deepest recesses of her being. It is the frost at the heart of the tree. Yes, believe me, sir, Blanche's temperament has something in it that passes ordinary understanding. And perhaps in a century less enlightened than ours, oh, come now, you're, topping, you're talking like some superstitious villager. The attachment you've always felt for your sister has led your judgment astray a little. Blanche appears to me to be most of the time natural and sometimes even cheerful. Oh, without a doubt, it has happened that she has almost deceived me, too. And I would have believed my concern unfounded if I didn't always read the curse in her face. Yes, what the voice can conceal, the eyes reveal. It is in the eyes, not the voice, that the fear betrays itself. That is something I have learned in the King's service, even though I'm still a mere novice. But why should I tell you what other more serious wars have already taught you well before I was born? The Marquis begins to make a gesture of denial, checks himself, then answers slowly like someone who is reflecting on old memories. My God, it's true. We used to know these things. They were useful to us on occasion. Nevertheless, I find them rather strange coming from you because we didn't think about them. 
That is the difference between our generation and yours. How the devil would, have I ha would I have had the idea of judging your sister on the basis of my experience with corporals and sergeants of the royal Picardy? Be wary of reasoning about everything as you are doing today. You run the risk of no longer understanding the reason for anything. When Blanche and her governess get here any moment now, you will laugh at your anxieties and she will forget hers. You mean she will have gotten off with just a fright one more time. Gotten off with just a fright. When it comes to Blanche, that phrase makes me shudder. A girl so noble and so proud, the ill has entered into her like a worm into the fruit. Oh, sir, such language must seem obscure or pedantic, especially coming from me. Please humor me in this. Send my sister outside the city to the countryside to take the spring air and drink the milk of our cows. Yes, to play at being farmers, as is the style today. Unfortunately, that is no way for a girl to find her place in the world. I would be foolish indeed to send my daughter away when I am beginning to welcome the attentions of your friend. Oh, little Damas could not pass for what in former days one would call a fine match. But I would gladly make him my son-in-law. What can you expect? I find the young men of today a little complicated for my taste. But that one is a real Frenchman, even a Frenchman of three centuries. He has the chivalry of one, the grace of the other, and the gaiety of this one. Yes, truly, he is what I call a fine Frenchman, a good boy, a gentleman in favor with the court of France. That is what Roger de Damas is. My God, you feel the same way about him as I do. He is my best friend. I love him like a brother. But don't deceive yourself. In the unfortunate circumstances in which she finds herself, my sister will never marry a man who is widely known as more reckless, more devil may care than most, and before whom she would, have, she would be afraid she might have cause for shame. Childish nonsense. Trust me on this, sir. I don't know if the bizarre nature of Blanche's character could lead her to some blameworthy action, at least insofar as the idea she has of her duty as a daughter of the nobility. But I feel strongly that she wouldn't survive such a marriage. The scene ends with the sudden appearance of Blanche at the doorway, with no idea of knowing how much of this conversation, if any, she's overheard.